Welcome to the first for us and, and maybe the first for everybody on this uh, podcast today. Uh, this is Blood, Sweat, and Business with John Chiapetta and Eric Jorn. Uh, also joining us is Rob Stoner and Mike Sikolsky from Expanding Her- Your Horizon podcast and Horizon Tech Now, or Managed Services. Gentlemen, welcome. Welcome. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah. So this was an interesting opportunity. We, uh, we both have been talking AI in, in both of our spaces, um, and we got together and we said, hey, we should just have a good, thorough discussion on the subject. We both have podcasts with good audiences in which I think we could share all this information with our listeners and, and provide a ton of value. So that's why we're here today. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think AI is, it's been the hot button topic for uh, the last half a dozen months or so. Uh, and it's it's not going to go away anytime soon. And I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of value we can provide business owners with kind of how to think about using AI and the new technologies that are coming. Yeah, we've been trying to sync up our schedules on this for a while. And I feel like if, <laughs> if we weren't discussing it already, we're already feeling a little behind in, in addressing the topic. But uh, on the flip side, there are so many businesses and so many people out there that don't even know what, say, ChatGPT is, although that's flooding everybody's universe at this point yeah yeah absolutely so yeah, yeah. i'm sorry Eric, go oh, ahead no no you got go no ahead. i can say it's funny it's actually i saw a clip of um you know i think the today show and there was like katie kirk was on there and i can't remember who else on there but they were talking about and this was like from 1994 and they're talking about email and they're, they're talking about was it an at symbol or is it you know they're trying to figure out what how the email construction actually was working and here we are talking about something so far from that. I just find that very interesting in, you know, 30 years, how far we've come with our technology. Absolutely. And, and it's, I think it's, it's you, you go from, like you said, talking about the at symbol and how do you call it? What do you, you refer to it as? And then we kind of evolved into like the, the hashtag or the, the pound symbol and all that with Twitter. And now it's, it's beyond, we're talking about how to reference something. And we're and instead we're talking about, how do we interface with something completely digital? Uh, but it doesn't require us making real changes. I, I, I think in a lot of ways, the, the, the thing that surprised a lot of people with ChatGPT is how you can just have a, a conversation with it, like, like you and I are talking right now, and how it will respond. And it, it's kind of creepy the first couple times you use it and how it just feels like a, a human on the other end of that. Totally. And I think it just came... It just came so fast. I mean, we know things have been creeping in. Things have happened, right? You have things like, you know, in our world, QuickBooks Online with its bank feeds and trying to auto-match transactions and things like that. You know, that's AI, you know, doing its thing. But this all of a sudden rush of everything happening, right? Chat GPT gets released, and now we have hundreds and hundreds of applications out there that do all sorts of things that can really accelerate the work that you're doing. It's also causing a ton of fear, uh, especially for workers out there, employees who, you know, they think they're going to get replaced by technology and robots. And I, I think one of our, one of our goals today really is to, is to maybe calm those fears and then help people understand how this can become a tool yet uh, not a enemy, I guess we'll call it. Absolutely. I think at least from my side, a lot of what I see and when I talk to people about their fears of, of AI and technology always advancing, this, this especially with GPT, it's more of an awakening of, hey, all the automation that c- that's come before has really been more going after the blue collar, the manual labor. Uh, it's kind of instead of sitting there using a shovel to dig a ditch, you're using an excavator and using tools to, to make a human more productive. And chat GPT and at least how it responds or how it feels to to us as humans interfacing with it, it feels like it's the first technology that's actually targeting more of the white collar, the knowledge uh, worker rather than the, the manual labor worker. And I think that's where a lot of the fear stems from. And it's, we, we've got an employee on the staff uh, who kind of was a little hesitant. So we, we rolled out GPT uh, to our entire team to tr- go, you know, it costs very little. Let's see what we can, what each of us can come up with in ways we can automate things. 
Uh, and he was a little hesitant to, to use it. And then he was running up against some, some bottlenecks and some, some issues writing some scripts for a, a specific challenge we were trying to solve. And so he said, fine, I'll give it to ChatGPT. Let's see what it comes back with. And he had been banging his head against the, the wall for a couple hours, two, three hours. And it came back in like 30 seconds and it had solved that problem for him. And then he started iterating and asking it, okay, clean up the code. Um, and it, 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 it made it more elegant. It made it run faster. It, it did a lot. And then it made up some things too. But, but his, his initial comment was, now I know what it feels like or what the, the iron workers in Detroit <laughs> must have felt like the first time those pre automated presses started showing up in, in the, the, the auto industry. It's like, it's a, it's a paradigm shift. We're seeing a little bit of what it's going to be able to do. And yes, it made him far more productive, but it also spooked him a little bit because a lot of what the, the knowledge worker, well, knowing how to, to search for things, how to understand and, and solve problems, a lot of that is now being automated or is going to be automated on the horizon. Oh, definitely. But on the flip side, right? What everybody essentially, you know, these people didn't lose their jobs, right? They, their jobs evolved. I mean, people got displaced, right? Things, positions got eliminated, but new positions opened up, and new positions opened up. And those who were willing to grow evolved into those roles. And quite frankly, I mean, it made us, to a certain extent, unlimited, or gave us unlimited potential to become more productive and to advance technology faster. I mean, the, the amount of speed in which we are advancing from a technological standpoint and a progressive progression standpoint, that wouldn't be doable if we were all fighting against certain waves of automation. I mean, we wouldn't be where we're at today. We'd still probably be in a much more manual world. I mean, we'd think about, I mean, John, think about the days like people were doing, you know, uh, I just heard this the other day. Somebody brought it up, how people would fill out a manual um, like organizer for a tax return, you know, the preparer would actually do, do that by hand, hand it to a typist who would key it into the software to then print the return. And then somebody would manually review that. And that wasn't that long ago. I mean, that was maybe 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you can always step back even further than that. <laughs> you're, you're typewriting, you know, using a typewriter to put the numbers on the tax form. Um, but I mean, Eric, yeah, you're exactly right. I think that, you know, when I even think of like bookkeeping, it wasn't nearly interactive as it is today with, with outside uh, or third party type of information coming into the software. Uh, it was all hand keyed. It was just very, and then to go back and try to get that data and get the detail of that data, well, it was just a journal entry. So you had to go back to some work papers that whether it was an Excel spreadsheet, it was somebody's receipts, you know, all this stuff is so, so much different in which we can upload and have all that documentation and all the data is right there in the software today. Ironically, it has not helped yeah. productivity that much because the, as the work itself has become less manual, the amount of longitude and latitude that we cover on it, just in the tax law itself has expanded greatly. And, and technology has really helped us absorb that expansion with, while, while not accelerating you know, costs and staffing and all that stuff. Yeah, we, we've kind of seen the same thing as while we can automate or, or eliminate some manual effort, the volume of work we're taking on by the same workforce is greater than it was five years ago. And I think that's going to be, that's going to hold true if not uh, become more uh, noticeable, uh, noticeable growth uh, uh, and all that as the years go on. And, and when it comes to the fear thing, I always go back to, let's look at movies. Movies are kind of common across everybody. We all go and enjoy movies. And I, I don't know what people think about the newer Marvel movies, but I always go back to like the original Iron Man first few couple films and look at Jarvis, right? Jarvis was an AI that was able to take a lot of what Tony Stark's ideas were. He'd say them out loud and then it would do the heavy lifting. So Tony Stark could go do something else. We're kind of seeing the inklings of that kind of technology with chat gpt and other ai products where it's you have the idea you're you're empowered to do things let the machine do the heavy lifting let you be the human that's being the creative uh but it's a very different uh approach and, and it's not something that that we as society are really used to right now uh aside from and, and that's an area where 
that's an area where AI currently and probably for the foreseeable future can't really get into is the creative side. It can take idea A and idea B and connect the dots, but if you ask it to come up with a completely new idea, it has a lot of trouble with that kind of stuff. And, and in a lot of what you can think of, at least with GPT-3 and 3.5, it was more, it was a really powerful version of predictive text. Like if you're typing a text message on your phone and it's su suggesting what next word is going to come with, it's taking a lot of information and going, okay, what are you, what's likely the best response? And I'm going to craft that response. And okay, what words would flow to, to connect the dots? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, people are probably thinking that this is all new, but it's just, it's been around. It's been ingrained for us for, I mean, how long has predictive, predictive typing become a thing? I mean, that, geez, that's at probably five, 10 years at least that I can think of Easily. where, you know, you, all of a sudden you hit the tab key and it finishes yeah, the sentence for you. For sure. And people love, I, I mean, as far, as far as I know, people have loved these little micro improvements in the, in this automation and this technology and not having to do these manual steps. I think it's, again, we're going back to that, to that just fear that all of a sudden this is just going to completely wipe out the whole, you know, everything altogether. And, um, you know, I'll, we'll be, I'll be frank with, with a lot of automation and technology that happens within say the accounting space, the, you know, the data feeds, the auto matching, the auto categorization, the, you know, pretty soon it's going to, you're just going to scan all your dot tax documents and it's going to fill out a whole tax return. You know, it takes a lot of human oversight. I think if we, they're, you know, QBO live has been around, right. And QBO live theoretically should be able to take, take all the work from us. They can go in, they, you know, they know the technology better than anybody else. They should know the technology better than anyone else we see files from that product and they're a total mess because it just automates everything and lets everything auto flow and just assume, you know, I think they operate under the assumption that it's all good. If the technology does it, it's all good. And guess what? As soon as one concept becomes incorrect, it just multiplies, multiplies, multiplies. If somebody that is that knowledge worker is not overseeing the technology, right? They still have you know, the person inside the factory watching that machine go making sure that it's operating at the right speeds, the right, you know, the, the right process, not breaking down. So it, it, it's just, you know, you no matter what, you're going to need at least some, some level of oversight, but then somebody's going to need to figure out when things go wrong, how to get back on the track. And, and that's, that's going to be kind of the key is we're going to have a lot less work where it's doing and a lot more of a, of a thinking of a problem solving of a, it's just going to change the way we work, not eliminate these jobs. Exactly. Uh, to go back to the analogy from earlier with the shovel versus the, the excavator, it's 100 years ago, it would have been uh, 15, 20 guys with shovels in the ditch. Now it's an excavator. And those 15, 20 guys are spread out on the job site doing other tasks, doing project management, doing maintenance. It's, it's shifting how we work, but it's not eliminating. But I think that that shift is getting confused um, and wrapped up in fear because like in a lot of ways, knowledge workers today are kind of doing the shovel. It's we figured out our process and then we're just doing that process not with knowledge <laughs> rather than with muscle. Uh, and now we're looking at that same kind of shift. I can't wait for it. And we see it too on, on our side over in the IT sphere. It's, it's not like it was 15, 20 years ago where we were having to get incredibly creative for each and every business to solve their challenges. It's, they're almost productized or compartmentalized. Then we've got a, a solution for challenges A through E and a solution for challenges F through M. Um, and it's like you, you were kind of almost plugging and playing in a way for a lot of small businesses, whereas 10, 15, 20 years ago, we were having to kind of reinvent the wheel each time based on how they were operating. And I think it's the same kind of thing is we're going to see a shift on the technology side away from even implementing the products because even doing that, is it the, the barrier for entry is, is getting lower and lower, just like you said with QBO Live and from the accounting side. And it's going to be more in how do we tie things together to automate or improve the process and being the oversight, ensuring everything's working correctly so that uh, an issue at the beginning of the stream 
doesn't become an exponential disaster when it gets downstream if it doesn't get caught. Totally. Um, what are what are some AI tools that you think? So I, I'm a worker, right, or I'm an employee, and I see AI creeping into my space, and I want to I want to get ahead of it. I want to adopt something. What's something that that you would recommend? Hey, let's let's adopt. What can I use personally? You know, maybe I'm a uh, maybe I'm a salesperson, right, and I want to start getting ahead on the AI thing. And what can I adopt? Without having specific names of tools, I, I can tell you for certain there are tools out there that'll do a lot of prospecting for you. A lot of if you're sitting there going to websites trying to scrape data, find co- key contacts, uh, trying to understand the the vertical and the industry that a business is in and their size and what some of their pain points might be, there are tools leveraging GPT or other AI products out there where you can just plug in. Okay, I want to be 15 miles geographically speaking in a radius around this point. And here's what I'm looking for. I mean, a perfect example is like LinkedIn Sales Navigator. And what you can do there, it's, that's not an AI tool per se, but it's a leveraging a lot of the same principles. Uh, and they're, because with GPT taking off six months ago or so, it's still pretty new. There are a lot of startup companies leveraging that kind of tech uh, for prospecting, for sales. But uh, one that comes to mind uh, that's a, a big company is Microsoft's doing a lot with their dynamic CRM and being able to, they, I mean, Microsoft's a huge investor in uh, OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT. Yep. And what they did um, is they've implemented ChatGPT and it's all of its predictions and all that into their CRM product, which is called Dynamics. And that hooks into email, it hooks into your calendar, scheduling, contracts, all of that. And I've got a colleague over in... Um, I think they're over in like the, the, the East EU somewhere. I, I forget the exact little country, but they're big mm-hmm. in dynamics and, and all this. And they enabled it, turned it on. It was able to grab meeting notes, make mm-hmm. meeting notes from some of their team's meetings with prospective clients, summarize it, automatically send out emails with uh, next steps and, and due dates for each of them. Uh, and then when that client responded saying, hey, so-and-so is out. Can we push this back a couple days? It created a draft of an email response, except understanding the implications, how that would impact production schedules, um, and said, yeah, no problem. Here's the changes and here's the downstream effect. And all it was doing is waiting for the, this person to click, yes, send that. Uh, and so it's, it's tools like that are coming. You're going to see it more and more introduced in major tool stacks like Microsoft, but you're also going to see that kind of tech coming into a lot of startup space, a lot of new ventures that are going to come up that you're not going to hear much about unless you look at that kind of like Y Combinator and the, the very early uh, in startup companies. But you're going to see a lot of that, a lot of nimble business, small businesses taking advantage of some of that and beating out more entrenched, larger traditional businesses because they're able to leverage technology, leverage AI to find the right decision maker, to find the pain point or to strike right at the right moment. And on top of that, if you're just looking for something simple, um, if you're a salesperson and you have, say, a standard form letter that you send out for prospecting, you can just run that through ChatGPT and ask it to rewrite it to make it sound more professional or to appeal to people in Industry X. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's one of the things that floored me when we used, started using it uh, across the team is that you could create personas. Uh, for chat GPT. So it responds to you as a marketing person or as a, a logistics person. Like I used it to, to review, I, I said, be a great marketer and here's my LinkedIn profile. How can I spice this up? And it came back and, and tightened the verbiage, expanded on it, made it more clear what the points that I was trying to get across. And it took me all like 30 seconds to, to just ask the question. Yeah, I, I think amazing. every person should probably have Chat GPT or open AI's login bookmarked on your on your browser page and you should probably have it open available to work on. You know, hey, hey, here's an email that I wrote, or hey, I need to write an email, you know, hey, I need to fire a client, write me a fire letter, write me a you know, write here's you know, or for us accountants, right? We're we're not maybe naturally gifted communicators. So Hey, write it. I'm going to write an email and generally it's going to be very to the point and 
hey, ChatGPT, can you soften this language or make this language more product productive, right? Hey, oh, can you add action items and do, you know, um, follow updates and things like that to, to this email? Uh, I mean, my world of tomorrow, I'm looking at it like, hey, I want to transcribe every meeting and every call that I'm in, feed that through some type of technology that will automate notes, summaries, and action items for everybody that participated on that call and or email. I mean, to me, A, that's going to create a ton of value just from the you know, follow-up and organizational standpoint. But B, I mean, we're going to get a lot more done, right? I mean, I think that a lot of it is, hey, I, I go to a meeting. I took Maybe I took really good notes at that meeting. But now i got to take all this data, and I probably took them by hand um, because we know that um, – you know, by hand will be more productive than uh, typing notes. And then, splat, you know, I, I'll probably not never get to the point where I transcribe them into an email, into follow-ups, into all those action items. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, because the minute you're out of that meeting, your focus is on what's the next fire, what next needs my attention. Exactly, exactly. Uh, just as an FYI, we... And that's also where kind of those fears can be allayed a little bit because for example that right there that's something that in all likelihood you're not going to hire somebody <laughs> to just sit on your calls and take notes True. for you but get a bot in there to do it for you oh sure well and I, I, a perfect example of this too of something that needed to get done uh, but the, it's time constraint, and you mentioned it earlier that you're not the most creative person. I'm certainly not either. And, and so coming up with like the outline for this episode, I was generated by Chad GPT, <laughs> and then I went, okay, this is a great outline. Let's tighten this up. Let's make this more to what we want to focus on. So it, it got rid of the 90% of just the manual generation effort that was just kind of, I need an outline, I need some bullet points, and now what can I? what do I need to add in? What's the stuff that... I really want to focus on or we want to make sure that we cover rather than the 90%, which is just getting the format correct and just getting the general ideas and concepts there. Totally. It provides you a launching pad, right? For whatever you, whatever you need to get exactly. done. I mean, I, I, could, I work in the content space since I, I work in our sales and marketing department and, you know, either I'm writing content for us or content for third parties and, it's changed my world in that regard where, you know, before I'd have to start with a blank page and that nothing's worse than starting on a blank page when you got to write, especially if you're not a professional writer, I can put a subject in chat GPT and I'm just editing, you know, you have to do a lot of work to get what you want out of it. Oh yeah. But it's so much easier. I got a starting point. I could, it, it could take me, it took me from taking maybe two hours to write a good blog post down to about 15, 20 minutes. As long as you remove the in conclusion <laughs> last sentence uh, that Chad GPT puts in everything, that, that's one of the key things. If they can figure out how to tweak making it not sound so scholastic, you know, it, it would be great. But I think that's just a persona. Yeah. Just change the persona <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Not... But yeah, I mean, it, it's like like you. I work better when I'm at least I've got some walls. I'm, I'm put in a box. The box may be pretty big and I can go paint the whatever color I want. Put me in a box and let me work within those constraints. Don't just give me an open world and I have to build everything. Because then it's going to, I'm going to get too caught up in the details and never actually get to the point of finishing what I need to, to finish. Uh, and, and so for me, anyways, that's been a huge benefit of being able to, to speed up and eliminate that, that menial work, I'm going to call it, the, the stuff that doesn't really provide value but needs to get done. Totally. Um, so for you guys, I think one thing, are you, are you delivering AI to any of your clients? Meaning like, are you having like help them utilize AI for their benefit? Right now we're not uh, mainly because, well, I guess it, I guess maybe it depends on what, how you define AI. Uh, where, where in the verticals we've typically uh, played in, it, it's more manufacturing industrial, uh, and so automation has been in those spaces for decades. Um, and so AI, I mean, you, depending on how you define it, could include automation or it could not. Uh, so like using machines to automate manual processes, yes, we, we've assisted clients doing that. 
but like AI and automation on like the, the white collar front. I mean, we've, we've built some tools over the years that have automated manual processes, like scraping data from websites or, or uh, automating entry of data uh, to eliminate manual errors and manual time spent entering data into forms and things like that. Uh, but it's, it's for us, it's evaluated on a case by case basis. We haven't seen anything that we can just kind of like push a button, roll it out to all the clients and they all see benefit right from the start. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I, I don't, I don't foresee that being too far though. I, no, I think, I think we're going to get pretty yeah. close to it soon. Uh, at least from a general business uh, AI I, approach. Within our firm, one thing I've tasked myself with, and maybe others are even working on it within the firm, is to start creating a catalog of AI tools. And, you know, he, here's the tool, here's its purpose, like a summarize, summary of their purpose, and then here's how I think it can be applied within the work that we do or the work that we perform. And, and just have that catalog, and it might be, you know, five apps, ten apps, 30 apps, you know, who knows at this point, it could be unlimited. Um, so my goal is to, is to start working on that catalog just because there's, there's so much, there's so much out there. I mean, there, you know, I just added one plugin for my browser that'll summarize a YouTube video for me. So if I don't want to watch a 30 minute YouTube video, it'll just give me the cliff notes. That's great. Mm -hmm. I think the risk, uh, the converse, there is a risk, though, of what does it drop? What does the AI think is relevant versus not relevant data uh, and all that? And, and so it's, it's a balancing act, right? Uh, and, and, and I think that's where the human element comes back in, like we were talking about earlier. It's someone watching over. Uh, I know there, depending on which news sources you, you follow, you may have heard about like uh, AI developers or just software developers in general and algorithms being biased. Uh, and that's been a, a concern for at least a couple of years of trying to remove implicit bias in the software that's just being written. And it's arguably can be proven that um, that software that is in, unbiased has implicit bias based on how it was developed and, and, and the choices made during development. Uh, and I think that's again, it's where it's it's never going to be completely autonomous. It needs that's oversight. so wild to think about, right? You know, it, I'm a developer. Maybe I don't like Fox News, so I'm going to make sure that search engine never pulls up in any type of news source from, say, Fox News or whatever. Well, and it's not even that that blatant. A lot of it, it, it doesn't even. It's not like there's a a ban on FoxNews.com. It's it's like just decisions uh, and completely unrelated areas on mm -hmm. how it weights the decisions and different keywords and things like that, that end up resulting in a oh. ban of Fox news or, or no results being returned from Fox news, but that wasn't the, the overt intention. Uh, it, it's just it, that kind of science is fascinating how it's almost a subconscious attack on, on an idea or something you're against. And then generally I, AIs need to be, I guess you could call it trained first and the content that they put in to train it can produce a bias as well. Just a matter of what content they put in and what content and they And I guess it out. could be unintentional too, right? Where, you know, maybe maybe some sources <laughs> writing style lowers it on the ranking scale with, with however they built the algorithm, right? So if somebody writes in a very, uh, maybe if they write in a very laxed manner, a very casual manner, is are these AI sources going to prop prop up those that are written with a very professional or very structured tone versus a very, you know, uh, casual tone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's that's one thing that just the, the average business owner needs to take into consideration is that yes, these AI tools, the the catalog of apps you were talking about building in your own firm. Uh, those are great and they can be like, uh, they, they can massively increase production uh, and output or remove a lot of manual tasks. But again, it, it, it there is a cost, there is a trade-off and that, that you need to understand that it's not just now a human looking at it, making the decisions and the choices that they've been trained to do, but that you're trusting those decisions and choices are going to be made by something uh, in the, the way you want, but you weren't involved in any of that training. 
And at least right now, uh, with the current generation of AI, you also need to watch out for uh, <laughs> making up things. Oh, yeah. Uh, the current generation of AI, when it is currently, when it is backed into a corner where it doesn't know something about a topic or there's some hole that it needs to fill, it will often just make things up that don't actually exist and put them into those holes. Yep. Uh, before. Um, one, of, one of our developers was... Uh, trying to put together a script to do something and uh the ai wrote the script for him and then when he asked the ai for documentation on this one piece of the script because it wasn't working right the ai gave him a link to documentation that actually doesn't <laughs> exist but it, it created the link for that documentation like it, here it is it made a link that looked exactly like a microsoft wow you know documentation link and but was that? it went nowhere. And before this call, I tested it with uh, some tax code. Uh, and I was like, hey, it, it, can I get an exemption for this? And I just kept pushing it, knowing, and knowing full well, no, this isn't something that I can claim and get an exemption for. And I was able to get it to say, yes, and here's what, here's what it, it, it qualifies as. And again, it was a dead link. It went nowhere, but it was backed into a corner, and it is always going to be right. It is a confident three-year-old. And that's, that's such a smart point right you you can use these technologies but you gotta you gotta be you gotta train your people on how do we how do we hold it accountable to give us the answers that we're actually needing and not just looking for trust but verify and and one of the great things is you can say hey can you give us a citation of of this right and follow i mean it's no different than how we do research today right i just google you know i I almost look at some of what we do is we're just much better at Googling, you know, say tax issues than any, anybody else. And our marketing consultant says, literally says the same thing. He's like, I'm very, I'm much better at Googling marketing concepts than you are. Like you can go look at the same exact, try to figure out the same exact problems and solve them yourself. But I'm much more, I know exactly what questions I need to ask. Yeah, and it's the same for us. It's we've got a foundation of knowledge, and so we can ask the questions that and formulate the questions and know what we need to look for that others who don't have that foundation of knowledge wouldn't know to ask. And it's, that's why we're in IT, and that's why we're in business. It's why you're in accounting. Is you know you've got that foundation of knowledge, and you know what to ask. Uh, and it's, it's every business has that their own niche of they have specific knowledge. And they're going to be better at Googling it and coming up with a solution than, than we are going to be. Uh, but AI doesn't have that foundation of knowledge. It's a, it's a general knowledge across a lot of things, but it's not going to always have that, that specific. Unless you're an engineer and you're willing to spend the 72 hours to go and research a subject and come through with 10 times as much detail as in actually need. Yeah. Uh, um. What are some other real world examples that you're seeing out there with AI and, and that you can see that people will be able to adopt, especially in the near term, right? Is we're, we're getting to a point where it's tomorrow, right? We need to start thinking about this tomorrow and implementing things tomorrow if we want to be on the forefront of it, if we don't want to be um, just reacting once it, once it becomes or once we get behind. You know, what are, what are some other tools or, or use cases that, you know, we've talked about chat GPT and maybe some distilling down meeting notes and automating follow-ups. Like what other type of AI tools are you seeing? Well, I mean, I don't know. what is it? Uh, we, here in Wisconsin, we've got a, a hospital EMR system called Epic. Uh, and, and they just ran a study of using AI to review case notes and start creating diagnostics and, and, and more importantly, in doing doctor responses to, to, cost, uh, to end user questions, to, to patient questions. Uh, and the, they, what they were looking for is, A, can, can uh, the AI craft an intelligent response to this question that is an unstructured query coming from a, a patient just asking anything about their, their healthcare? And two, is it going to be uh, on point like a doctor would be able to address it technically? And three, what is the customer's response and reception of that, that AI generated message? And I don't remember the specifics, but they found that uh, as a whole, 
the, the, that AI was able to craft better messaging that was still addressed everything, but was done in a, a, a much better bedside manner or in a tone that was received much better by the patient. Um, and that customer serve, like the, the, the customer sentiment, the seats sat or whatever, went up with the AI generated responses. And it also then saved the doctors a bunch of time, uh, structured time in reviewing questions and doing research and having to respond. And it was just a, well, all they would have to do is review the question, review the AI response and say, basically go no go. Uh, and if it, the ones that they said, no, that's not a good, then they'd have to do that, that kind of work. And it's, I think there's a lot to be said and a lot to be figured out in the, the client experience arena uh, where AI is really going to take off. Because let's say you've got uh, a customer service rep, Sally, who comes in, she's usually great, but she's having a bad day or whatever. And I guarantee you her responses to client inquiries that day are going to reflect that tone. But AI is going to be have whatever tone you program it to have or, or have told it to have. And so it's going to be able to deliver that same level of, of client experience, um, regardless of what's going on in, in Sally's world, and do it 24-7-365. So chatbots. <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately, they're going to... They're, they're, Becoming more they realistic, chat but it's going to solve a lot of problems, right? It's going to solve. Hey, here are like the top fifty questions. I mean, that's how you. That's how chat chat bots are built today, right? Here are the most common questions that we see. Here are our answers to those questions, <laughs> right? But however, if I'm plugging in an AI technology and it's analyzing all the questions that come into me as a practitioner and my responses. Eventually, it's going to learn, okay, here are the questions I have, and here are my responses, and it's going to build the ultimate chat bot or the ultimate, hey, here, client, client sends me an email saying, hey, uh, you know, I wanted to, you know, what's the HSA limit for 2023? And my, my, all of a sudden, I, I'm going to have, like, a thing pop up that says, respond to the client, here's the limit, because you've answered this question 100 times already this year. Do you want us to send it? And mm -hmm. I say yes, and I mean, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it, it saves you from having to type it out. And it, it's it, from the, the chatbot perspective is right now, a lot of those are being, those flows are being mm -hmm. built out manually. And with an AI, you don't need to build the flow. It can just respond and react and on the fly, create whatever flow it needs and give an option to go to a, a human uh, operator, a customer service rep, whatever, what have you, when needed, rather than you've built the flow and, oh, we hit the end of the flow, this is, issue isn't resolved, would you like to talk to some? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just it, the, the opportunities are endless in that yeah. regard. Yeah, I think actually just before I was talking about, um, you know, from a financial planning perspective, just a, use an AI to help me build portfolios, you know? Um, you know, I say, this is, this is my risk tolerance. These are, this is kind of what I'm looking for. I'm looking for value. I'm looking for dividends, whatever. Um, uh, yeah, I can, it's just pretty amazing to me, but you're right. You still have to check it though. You know, you could look at the portfolio and say, this, you know, this isn't a fund that I really want to have in here or something, whatever the case might be. But you know, um, you're not starting from ground zero. You're not starting with a white piece of paper. Yeah. Uh, I think. What was it the other day? I read an article. J.P. Morgan's uh, building their own GPT bot mm. specifically for uh, stock picking, and it was uh, back at the beginning of, of May that uh, CNN reported Chat GPT had outperformed some of the the world's top fund managers in picking stocks in their performance. Oh. And it's at the end of the day, a lot of this knowledge, this white collar, this this high level, it's just analysis and being able to connect the dots in massive data sets. And that's where AI can really take off and find things that you wouldn't necessarily see or that would be historically be seen as a savant level person being able to see those connections. And it's really just now being distilled down to a machine or a program. Well, I mean, the opportunity for, for to do data queries within a chat-based system is going to be revolutionary to, to figuring out things that are happening within your business or within your life. I brought up, we were evaluating yep. a vendor who, you know, they do some, it creates a little bit of automation and matching invoices to what's been being built out, which I love the idea of that. But then I asked, and it also pulls out like, what did you mark it up at? And I said, Hey, are you looking at a, a search bait? Are you looking to add an AI here 
in which I can say, hey, can you pull open or can you list me out what parts do I not mark up at least 55 or do I not have a, at least a 55% gross margin? Because that's say that's my goal gross margin. And if it gave me all those parts, then I could say, okay, what? And then I can ask a, a drill down question further, like, hey, what is the demographic of the customers that are purchasing these parts? And then you can say, what do, you know, when do they come in or mm-hmm. who is the person that's working with these the most? Right. And that's going to be all data that, that should be accessible that right now to try to put together that data costs a ton of money and resources. But if you have AI, the ability for that to go in, figure all that information out and give it to you in return, especially replying in, in a way in which you you're not building that query manually. Right. It's a question. You know, that's that's where the real value comes in is I have a question in my mind. Right now, I have to figure out how to manually build that data query to get the responses that I want. And as soon as AI can do that for us, I mean, we will be able to drive so many details out of a business in which we can make micro improvements to the day to day on such a regular basis. I mean, that, it just gets my juices flowing. I'm, I'm super excited to, to see where this comes and, and how it can give us the opportunity to improve. Yeah. I mean, in the enterprise space, it's been like uh, business intelligence tools mm-hmm. uh, like Power BI. Uh, and similar that we, you would have to have teams of developers building out. You'd have to know the questions ahead of time so that you can build uh, the data in a structured way. And, and now it's more of taking that that structure and all that work and giving it to us in just a chat form so you can have an unstructured question. And the AI is able to just look at all the data and figure out, okay, how do I need to build this query so that you, as the person asking the question, doesn't need to do all that manual labor. You just need the answer. You're the business owner that goes, hey, what parts haven't I marked up or am I not making enough gross margin on? And then you don't have to sit there and figure out all the details. Just give me the list, the data. You're able to interface with it like you would interface with any other employee on your team. Yeah, I mean, it, but it's just, it's a fascinate, it's, it's fascinating to dream about see yeah let's see how long it'll take for them to implement and down into uh to us normal folk who aren't i think it's yeah. it's a lot of hurry up and wait but uh but it's good yeah. to have a plan to understand what the next steps are i mean even if i'm down to the you know down to the employee you know hey how's my job going to change I'm, i want to forecast how my job might change and what can i do to stay relevant to stay ahead of things and you know, hey, is this, is it maybe a time for a career pivot, right? Maybe I just love slamming data. You know, I love writing emails from scratch, right? You know, there's people out there that are, that would say that, or I love just keying data into a system, a database or a spreadsheet, you know, and if that, if, mm-hmm. if AI, if I believe my organization is going to implement AI and that's what I truly love to do versus, you know, hey, take that off my plate so I can do the next best thing. You know, maybe it is time for a switch, a switch in career paths. Yeah. And I mean, I think in a lot of ways, this is almost like the white collar version of the industrial revolution of you had a lot of people pivoting and changing their career paths and their jobs and all that at that time. And now it's the same kind of thing just for a different generation and a different, not class of workers, but a different class of workers, a different type of work being performed. And so you're, you're absolutely right is, is people need to, to take a moment to reflect inward and say, what is it that I'm actually doing? What are my skills actually? Not just what am I doing today, but what what do I want to be doing and what am I skilled at doing that can't just be replicated by a machine for a fraction of the price? Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, yeah. as, a, as a business owner in a space in which our talent pool is consistently shrinking in the CPA space, any tool that I can find to make my team more productive is a huge win in our book because for us to hire that next best person is, is a huge challenge right now. And, and especially to get them to stay in the long term, right? Every, the world has changed. The job market has changed. You know, the average, I think it's like three to five years of the average span of a career for some, or of a, of a stay at a company, uh, of yeah. a stay at a company. Yep. Um, you know, so can I create an environment in which that person can really succeed yeah. Um, can be the best practitioner to get the most. Think think about the cost it is to train somebody, and then they leave early. No, think use an AI for the training process mm-hmm. to reduce your costs. 
in that that space as well. I'm just thinking in my head. I'm like, I mean, you're right though. It is in our space, and I don't know how it is in in IT so much, but finding the next employees and and keeping him keeping them here uh, is tough. I think it's it's a lot of it's a lot yeah. of um, a lot of uh, dollars and cents of, of weight on the company to to, to manage that. Yeah, for us, it's typically six month minimum ramp time from when we hire them, even if they're experienced to when they're able to be productive. They understand the the mission, vision, values of the firm and how decision making is happening so that they're empowered to just operate and execute without having to go back to the well every time a question comes up. And if we're able to leverage AI or process improvement or automation, whatever term you want to use to streamline that, it's... For us, training isn't so heavy, but it's the understanding the process and, and what the goals are and when, what they're empowered to do. If we can streamline that so that they can achieve faster uh, or that we can take the menial tasks off their plate so that they're empowered. To, for us, most of the time, it's people that love working technology. I don't know if it's people that love doing math uh, for accountants. That, that's certainly not my strength and not what I love to do. Uh, but it's if we can let them play with technology and, and, and sit there and tinker, so to speak, uh, and, and let them live in that area where they excel and their skills are, are really honed, They're, that's where they thrive and that's where we start seeing people lasting longer. Uh, but if it's just menial and just plugging someone in, even though we can automate a process, they're not going to stick around much and it's going to be a very expensive process for us. Definitely. I, I'd say accountants, they're less math people and more like, they can look at a plate of spaghetti and figure out a way how to make it all straight noodles. <laughs> uh, That's a good one. A different analogy. I like it. <laughs> of course, I'm Italian, so I'm talking pasta. We're good. Exactly. There you go. So <clears throat> I think we discussed about maybe diving into some deeper details and subsequent podcasts um, for the subject. So we're, we're, you know, for our listeners, we're thinking about creating a little series uh, of this, maybe deep diving in, in some, into some examples of tools and uh, maybe some predictions on where things are going to head next and what you should be doing. Um, if, you, if you're listening into this episode, you know, please share it with your colleagues, friends, and family, um, especially if they're concerned about AI replacing jobs. I think it's a huge opportunity for them to start building that understanding. Uh, definitely you know, keep your eye out for that next podcast as well. Um, just because, hey, we're going to start talking about tangible tools that maybe you can implement into your day-to-day. And then uh, def- definitely with that follow-up of, hey, where, where are things moving next, uh, just so you can stay ahead of the curve. Absolutely. And then uh, if you have any feedback or questions, you know, feel free to post on our social media channels. I think we're both uh, very active, uh, Hari- Horizon Managed Services. Did I get that right this time? I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna flop and call you guys you did, yes. technologies. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and uh, yep. Kaizen CPAs and advisors. We're both pretty active on on social media. Just give it, give the good old Google search a try, and uh, we'll pop up. Leave some feedback. 